Imagine someone gives you a teapot, and your job is to explain it to a computer. What language would you use? In computer graphics, we're always on the hunt for the best language to describe a given object. There are many methods we can pick from, but one stands out. This method is known as polygonal modeling. Its brilliance lies in its simplicity. To demonstrate, let's take a simple sphere. If we cover it with a net of flat shapes, we get a polygonal model. This video aims to walk you through everything I wish I had known when I first started using polygonal models. A polygon is a 2D shape formed by connecting points with straight lines in such a way that they form a closed loop. The points that make up the polygon are called vertices, lines are called edges, and the area inside is called face. Now, let's take this intuitive notion of polygon and mold it into a representation that we could use with our computer. Let's first do this in 2D space. We can represent our vertices by assigning a position to each one of them. Our edges simply by pairing vertices which form their endpoints. And the face just by listing edges that make up the closed loop. This way we can represent any polygon in 2D space that we might want to use. But there is a little caveat. We can make a polygon that intersects itself. Self-intersecting polygons can cause many problems, especially during rendering. So let's look at a few practical scenarios where this might pop up. One scenario is that you're creating a polygon using some tools available to you, for instance a pen tool. If you misuse the tool, you can easily end up with a self-intersecting polygon. The second common scenario is when you're editing existing polygons. My advice is, Unless you have a specific reason to create a polygon with self-intersecting edges, try to avoid it. To take polygons to 3D, we can simply assign 3D coordinates to our vertices instead of 2D ones. However, because we're now in 3D, there is another caveat. Polygons by definition are 2D objects, which means that the entire polygon should lie in a plane. But, our representation allows for polygons whose vertices aren't in a plane. Technically, those are no longer polygons and the name we usually use for them is a non-planar polygon. They are pretty similar to the self-intersecting polygons. They also can cause many problems, especially during rendering. And you can encounter them when you're manipulating or creating polygons. Now, let me offer you a potential solution to both of those issues. The solution is simple, just use triangles. If we take any three points in 2D space and use them as vertices, we will get a single triangle. And this triangle won't ever self-intersect in a way more complex polygons could. On top of that, any three points in 3D space always lie in some plane which means that it is impossible to create a non-planar triangle. Those two neat properties, among other things, are why people sometimes use only triangles in their models. Let's finally see how exactly we can represent our models by gluing together a bunch of polygons. To do that, we'll break down our model into three parts, vertices, edges and faces. For vertices, let's create a table with two columns, one for the names of the vertices and the second for their positions in the 3D space. Similarly, we will create a second table for edges. The first column will contain the name of an edge and the second will store the names of the vertices that make it up. For instance, from this row, we can see that edge E4 has vertices V4 and V2 as its endpoints. Last but not least, we'll create a table for faces, 
which in the first column will store the name of a face and in the second list of all edges that make up its outlines. For instance, this row tells us that the face F1 is formed by outline made up from edges E4, E5 and E3. And that's it. With those three simple tables, we have entirely described our model. In general, when you represent an object by describing its vertices, edges and faces, you're describing a polygonal mesh. In practice, we represent polygonal meshes with data structures. If you haven't encountered the term before, a data structure is simply some strategy to store and organize information. Describing the polygonal mesh by creating three tables as we did is precisely that. The thing is that there are many other data structures to describe polygonal meshes. Sadly, we don't have the time to cover them in this video, so if you're interested, check out the description for more information. Creating a polygonal mesh by manually specifying all vertices, edges and faces is the most fundamental approach. In the early days of computer graphics, this involved carefully drawing polygonal nets over physical objects and based on them calculating the positions of vertices in the 3D space. The structure of these nets helped define the necessary faces and edges. This was really time consuming, but it laid down the groundwork for modern computer graphics. To streamline this process, we can tap into mathematical knowledge. Geometric shapes like spheres, cones and torses have neat mathematical representations. By translating these representations into algorithms, we can efficiently generate polygonal meshes for these shapes. But the problem with both of those methods is that they weren't really meant to be used by artists. One is painstakingly slow and the second requires using mathematics and writing code. This is where classical polygonal modeling comes to the rescue. The idea is simple. You start with some shape resembling your object and then iteratively apply various editing operations to refine it into the final model. To do this, you only need two things, some library of starting shapes and a few operations that edit your geometry. Every major 3D software package includes a library of basic shapes, known as geometric primitives. Typically, this library features shapes such as cubes, spheres, terraces, and so on. Most of these shapes, as you might guess, are based on mathematical representations. Similarly, operations to edit geometry come with almost all 3D packages. While each software has its unique features, common operations include manipulating vertices, adding edge loops, extruding faces, and so on. Hands-on experimentation is the best way to get started using them. Besides those straightforward methods, there are some other ways to get polygon models. You can, for instance, capture photos of your object from many angles and then use photogrammetry to forge those photos into polygonal mesh. Or you could try out the digital equivalent of sculpting and color the result you create the polygonal mesh. My personal favorite way of obtaining polygonal models is by running physical simulations that deform your geometry in an interesting way. Now that we know how to create polygonal models, let's shift our focus to rendering them. Rendering is the process of transforming our 3D models into 2D images. There are two primary classes of rendering methods we use nowadays, rasterization based and ray tracing based. They both take in a description of a virtual scene and output a 2D picture. Rasterization is exceptionally fast which is ideal for games and real-time applications. However, it can't accurately replicate how light interacts in the real world. On the other hand, ray-based methods can simulate light quite accurately. So we use them to create images indistinguishable from reality. But the trade-off is that they are much slower. Let's look at how we can compute the color of a single pixel using ray tracing. 
pixels are often larger than the fine details of the scene, which means that there can be multiple different colors within a single pixel. Because of this, we usually compute the final color by averaging multiple points. To get the color at a specific point, we need to identify which part of our 3D scene corresponds to that point. In ray tracing, this is done by casting a ray from the camera into the scene to find where it intersects with an object. At the intersection, we calculate the normal direction, a vector perpendicular to the intersection point. The normal direction is crucial because it influences how light behaves when it hits the object, which in turn influences shadows in our render. We then use this information, among other things, like the color of the intersected object, properties of our light, and so on, to compute the color for that specific point on the pixel. Repeating this process across all pixels, we gradually build up the complete image. Now, equipped with our knowledge, we can solve one important problem. Polygon models are inherently made up of flat shapes, but we want to use them to represent smooth objects. There is a well-known trick in computer graphics for this. We're going to use normals to make polygonal models look smooth. Take for instance a polygonal sphere. By definition, its normals look like this. Which is the reason why we can see the flat shapes that make it up. But if we alter its normals to imitate the normals of mathematically perfect sphere, the render will be smooth. While this technique is highly effective, it's not flawless. There are slight visual imperfections, particularly around its outlines. A crucial aspect of bringing polygon models to life is texturing. Imagine texturing as painting your model. It's how we put different colors and patterns on the surface of an object. To pull this off, we use a technique called texture mapping. Basically, we assign each vertex of our model a position and texture space, which, in the simplest case, is a 2D space where our texture lives. This step forms a bridge between the 3D world of our model and the 2D realm of the texture. With this bridge in place, we can draw 2D pictures and they will appear on our model. And that brings us to the end of our journey. If you enjoyed and learned from this video, you can consider supporting me through channel memberships. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.